I rejoice for those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. <laughs> Your brothers and sisters in Christ our Savior, live however you please. You might have been a bit taken aback when you saw that in the worship folder as the theme for my message today. That would seem to go against everything I've ever taught you about how God wants us to live our lives as His children. In fact, it sounds an awfully lot like the philosophy that many people in our world follow that goes against directly against what we believe to teach. It kind of sounds like an anything goes philosophy. That, that philosophy would sound something like this. If you want to do something, or you desire to do something, then it must be okay, so go ahead and do it. Or, if you're okay with it, then who cares what anybody else thinks, God included. Don't let anyone else limit you. Be your own person, go do your own thing, and do whatever it is that you want to do. That course would not be in line with what God teaches in his word. But I still think we can say live as you please and understand that properly. See the way for us to understand that properly is to stop and ask the question, well what is it that you please? Or what is your pleasure? Or maybe we can even be a little bit more pointed to help us understand that properly and say, as baptized children of God, what is your pleasure? See, so today we talk about baptism. And, and as we talk about our baptism, we're reminded that baptism wasn't just a one-time event that had one-time effects. It was a one-time event where God brought some great blessings into our life, but those blessings are ongoing and continue to impact and influence every single day as we live our lives as God's people. So let's sit back and listen to God speak to us through His Word today to help us understand properly through the sacrament of baptism how we can rightly say, live as you please. Let's keep that thought in our mind as we turn to our text from the book of Romans, chapter 6, the first 11 verses. What shall we say then? <clears throat> shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, He cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over Him. The death He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life He lives, He lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God, in Christ Jesus. So far, the words of our text. Now, there are many church bodies that do not believe that anything happens in baptism. They see baptism as nothing more than a sign or a symbol that represents or helps us remember what Jesus did for us. In fact, pastors in those churches, I've heard say, your baptism doesn't matter at all. Some will even cheapen it further to say it's nothing more than an initiation rite or a sign that you have joined a certain congregation. 
Scripture tells us something much deeper happens during holy baptism. When the Bible talks about baptism, it uses action words to describe what's happening. The Bible says baptism saves. Baptism washes away sin. Baptism cleanses us. Baptism gives us the Holy Spirit. Our text tells us that baptism unites us or, or connects us to Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection. In other words, it says that that God gives to us in baptism the blessings that Jesus won for all people. In his small catechism, in answer to the question, what benefit does baptism give, Martin Luther explained it this way. It works forgiveness of sins, delivers from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this, as the words and promises of God declare. Baptism works faith. By using a very simple means, God comes through the water and the promises of baptism to wash away sin, to make people holy, to raise them to spiritual life and give them the promise and certainty of eternal life. What awesome blessings God brings to baptism. Blessings that are greatly needed. And those are such needed blessings because we are born into this world as sinners. Now, that, that's a hard concept for, for many people in our world to really come to grips with. We are born into this world as sinners. But it's true. In fact, recently a parent expressed to one of our teachers. I can't believe a Christian school would deal so much with sin. As if to say she couldn't believe her child would be called a sinner or that there would be other sinners in school. It's not an uncommon thought in our world today. It's hard to admit that we're sinners. It's even hard to admit that we were born into this world spiritually dead. But that's the truth. And that was a problem we could not overcome by ourselves. And so how awesome that God would attach His promise to the waters of baptism so that through that He could make a change in us. So that God could come through the waters of baptism to, to wash away our sin. To connect us to Jesus' death. To make his death our death, his burial our burial, so that our sin could be done away with forever. A former professor from our seminary, who is now in heaven, had a very interesting way of illustrating what happens in baptism. He recalled his earlier days when many churches had cemeteries right outside of the church. And the funeral procession would go directly from the church out to the grave. He said it this way, the, the pallbearers would carry the coffin from the church directly to the cemetery. Now usually the, in the hole there was a, a pine box that was laid down at the bottom and a pine cover would lay on the mound of dirt next to that hole. Before the committal service they would place the coffin down into the hole in that pine box and put the cover on top of it. Then one of the men would go down into that hole and would nail the cover to the pine box. When the service began, the, the pastor would stop when he got to the words, earth to earth. And one of the elders who had been standing at that mound of dirt with his foot on a shovel would take a shovel full of dirt and throw it on top of that box. Can you imagine the sound that dirt would make as it was hitting the pine box? Earth to earth. Boom. Ashes to ashes. Boom. Dust to dust. Boom. It would be a heart-wrenching sound. That's when people would start to cry. 
But that's what happens to sin when a child is baptized. What a neat illustration. That's what happens to sin at baptism. It's washed away and buried so that the person is raised to live a new life as God's people. Brings a whole new meaning to the concept God washes away sin. He buried it with Christ. He connects it to Christ's death and burial. In baptism, sin has been paid for. Death has been defeated. Hell has been conquered. And God gives all of that to us in the blessing of baptism. But the awesome thing is the blessing of baptism don't stop there. Paul in this section is going on to explain to us how it has an ongoing, continual impact and influence in our lives. Because baptism not only connects us to Christ's death, it also connects us to Christ's life. It connects us to a living Savior. Baptism makes us new people who have completely new lives to live. With the guilt of sin done away with forever, God's people through baptism are equipped, enabled, and empowered to now do things that please God. Since death no longer reigns and, and sin is done away with, the believer is able to live a life that would be pleasing to God. In that new life, a believer out of thanks and praise will now want to live a new life of willing and cheerful service and obedience to God. And having been rescued from sin, so thankful of the eternal wonderful gift that God has given through baptism, the believer will now want to go out and to live life in a way that's fully in line with what God wants. See, being connected to Jesus means that your wants and desires now are similar to his wants and desires. Now our pleasure is to worship God. What pleases us as baptized children of God is to live the life God wants of us. By definition, if a person is a Christian, he wants to live the perfect life God set for us. See, if we can live the life that we please, that would be what we do. It would be a perfect life. We wouldn't act out in anger. We wouldn't act contrary to God's word. We would be perfect. And so really, to, to a person who has nothing but a desire to demonstrate gratitude to Jesus for the wonderful gift he gives through baptism, we can rightly say, go. Live as you please. Of course, we absolutely have to be careful about falling into a perverse line of thinking. Paul, up to this point in Romans, had been talking about God's grace and, and what a wonderful gift God's grace is. But he also anticipated the, the sinful nature grabbing hold of that and trying to twist it in this way. Well, if grace is good, and you get grace from sinning, maybe I should go sin more so I get more grace. That would be parallel to a, a thought today where someone says you can't preach about free grace because it's just an invitation to people to go sin more. Or to others who see God's grace as a get out of jail free card that says, you know what? I know that God will forgive me. I'll go ahead and do it anyways and I'll worry about the forgiveness later. To all of that, Paul very bluntly says, oh by no means. <coughs> Literally, he says, may it never be. One of the strongest ways to, uh, to negate something, may it never be. Paul says, we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? You see, sin is no longer our pleasure. As baptized children of God, we don't find our pleasure in sinning. It means we don't find pleasure in sneaking around and spreading rumors about other people. We aren't to find our pleasure in going out and slandering others and, and ruining their reputation. We don't find our pleasure in 
causing other people to sin or, or making poor choices as we're out with the friends at night. We don't find it our pleasure to live in repetitive sin and with unrepentant hearts. That's not what God designed baptism for. God designed baptism not only to wash away sin, but to give us a new life. Not a life that, that chases after sin, but a life that seeks to glorify God and serve Him in everything and with everything. Of course, we all know how hard that is to do. Paul, too, would often talk about his sin and refer to how difficult it is for him to do what God wants him to do. We understand that dilemma. It's very difficult for us to turn away from things that seem to be fun when we know that they're wrong. It's very hard for us to say no when every part of our body wants to say yes. We know that doing the right thing is not usually doing the easy thing. But that's what God has called us to do as his children. That's the battle we're now engaged in. See, the very moment we were baptized, God put us into a battle against sin, death, and the devil. That sign of the cross that was made both on the heart and on the head not only marked us as children of God, but it also now identifies us as enemies of Satan. And until we meet God face to face, that means we'll be engaged, locked in a battle against Satan and sin that will challenge our faith and our salvation. Our life as baptized children of God is now constantly pushing away the rule of sin in our life to let our pleasure more and more be to worship God and serve Him. We know all about that battle. Right? Do you have a sin that, that you're struggling with? Do you have a, a sin that, that keeps rearing its head in your life? Does your, your temper flare up and, and let itself loose too often and, and hurt others that are close to you? Are obscenities a, a normal part of your vocabulary? Do bitterness and and gossip flow all too easily from your lips? Do your loins burn with desire for someone who isn't your spouse? Is your heart filled with a jealous discontent? Is there a sin that, that you keep doing over and over again, even though you've told yourself, I'm not going to do that again, and even though you promised God, it'll never happen? And yet it keeps happening over and over and over again. We know what it's like to be a slave to sin. We know what it's like to feel as if sin is our master, that it just controls us. There's doesn't allow us to do the good we want to do, almost forces us to do the evil we don't want to do. This is the battle we face. And yet here's where the, the blessing of baptism comes in. and makes an influence, an impact in the life that we live each and every day. First and foremost, when we commit those sins, we can go back to our baptism. Hi. And be reminded of and encouraged by the fact that then at that baptism, God washed our sins away. That sin was buried with Christ. It died with Christ. It was buried. It is gone from God's sight forever. And as we're encouraged by that fact, we also remember baptism also now freed us from sin as our master. Now we are free as children of God to serve God. Now you can deny your anger. You're no longer a slave to sin. You have a choice. Obscenities no longer control you. Sin is not your master. Bitterness and gossip no longer lead you. Desire no longer imprisoned you. Jealousy no longer contains you. Sin is not your master. 
Now your desire, your pleasure is to go out and serve God. And baptism set you free to do that. Now you're free to let your gentleness be evident to all. Now you're free to let praises flow from your lips. Now you're free to be kind and compassionate with one another. Now you're free to keep the marriage bed pure. Now you're free to be content with God has given you. Now you're free to be the children of God He made you to be. Now you're free to go out and live as you please. When what you please is to live as a child of God. Oh, it may sound like heresy at first when you say it. But it's okay to go live as you please. When your pleasure is to go serve God and live as his children. See, that really comes back to understanding what is your pleasure. Is it to gratify the desires of the sinful nature? Or is it to live a life of willing and cheerful obedience to your God in heaven? What a great reminder and encouragement Paul gives to us today. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? When those sinful desires rear their ugly heads to try and turn you away from God or silence His <laughs> voice in your head, it's the Holy Spirit given to you at baptism that calls you to put that desire to death. It reminds you that sinful nature has been buried with Christ and you now have a new life to live as God's children. Treasure your baptism. Treasure the blessings God brought to you at baptism and that God continues to bring to you through baptism. Count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Then go out, understanding it properly, and live as you please.